three years old, sitting on the floor and playing with Legos. I match shapes and colors to create a rather sizable, yet useless block. My parents look down at my so-called invention in faint amazement. Then, I'm four years old, and I'm making an art collage out of scraps of paper and poorly cut out images. Now, I'm 17, and the four-year-olds that I see and work with are coding directional bots and learning the sequencing skills that are the root of every type of programming. A five-year-old is designing an original avatar on a 3D program. A six-year-old is customizing an airplane on the laser cutter to make it stay in the air for as long as possible. Think of the skills and talents that these students will continue to develop as they reach 10, 15, 30, and even 50 years old. Currently, it isn't just STEM students that have this development track. It's every student. Our world is ever-growingly and exponentially dependent on AI and technology. Our future citizens, legislators, and leaders need to be equipped to navigate these complicated fields. I'm here to tell you how. Good evening. My name is Ariel Scout Hudson, and I'm a senior at Miami Country Day School. I fell in love with engineering and the makerspace at a very early age. In middle school, I taught myself how to 3D design and 3D print, and ever since, I've kept progressing. Last year, I founded EI Squared, our school's first ever invention-based honor society, as well as our high school robotics team. Recently, I spoke at the Florida Council of Independent Schools Conference as the first and only student to have ever participated. Today, I'm here to share with you my experiences surrounding educational development. So I've been at Miami Country Day School for 14 years. And during that time, I've seen and been a part of so much change, especially within the Garner Center of Innovation or our school's makerspace. In sixth grade, I discovered the space completely by accident. Never before had I heard mention of a paradise on campus with unlimited access to 3D printers, laser cutters, and a fully working wood shop. Despite the rather deserted atmosphere, I pledged my every free minute to learn how to use the technologies within the space. In eighth grade, a team of faculty members were finally brought in to develop it. New resources got ordered, the broken machines got repaired, and finally, there's a support system. People to talk to, people to listen to, but most importantly, people to support you. And as a result, classes of all divisions began to pour in, lower, middle, and upper school. I remember watching some of the first high school, high school classes tackle the design challenges posed to them by the faculty. I watched them awkwardly grapple with concepts like 3D design and basic block coding, things that to me seemed rather rudimentary, at least for a high school student. When these seemingly simple tasks didn't come easily, most students simply dismissed the lesson as if it didn't matter. In contrast, when I found myself guiding lower and middle school students through the very same exercises, although they also faced difficulty, they attacked it far more open-mindedly and gracefully than the high schoolers did. I remember years ago vividly, in the midst of an extremely busy maker affair, being asked to teach a four-year-old student how to 3D design. I remember looking down at the three foot tall or so little kid and wondering if he even knew how to formulate complete sentences. Nevertheless, we sat down at the computer and I instructed him to open a new tab. He picked up the mouse, looked up at me and asked, what's this? Realizing that a four-year-old probably hasn't used a desktop yet, I had to explain to them the mouse, the keyboard, and how that related to the seemingly massive screen in front of him. Once we got over this, I started getting into the concept of 3D design. Now, one of the most difficult things to understand for 3D design is extrapolating a three-dimensional image from a two-dimensional screen. Two objects seemingly aligned from one perspective when rotated by 90 degrees cannot even be touching. Now this is something that's not uniquely difficult to little kids. Everyone has to get over this hurdle at some point. But nevertheless, he came back 20 minutes later with his avatar. And I will admit his avatar wasn't quite humanoid, more so a collection of shapes and spheres that kind of resembled a person. But nevertheless, I was impressed. The most interesting part of this entire experience was when I was transferring the file from the printer, it was among a high school class avatars. Now, creating an avatar is a fairly common exercise that we do to kind of get into 3D design. But remarkably, I struggled to tell the difference between the four-year-old and the high schooler. The seemingly simple tasks didn't come easily. 
years of math and science hadn't taught these students these concepts, and certainly not how to apply them. Now, this is one of the better high school figures. Some students with some worse ones, I didn't want to do a public shaming, so <laughs> keep that in mind. So I hadn't tracked the years or by any means, but I realized that some of the first students to ever have these teachings in lower school have transitioned into middle school. What made me realize this was when a student asked me to explain a feature on Fusion 360. For those of you who may not know, Fusion 360 is a completely complicated 3D design app used by many engineering professionals. By no means is this one four-year-old friendly. I had learned this on my own time simply out of interest, but it seemed like this student was just following the natural progression of what his lower school and early middle school experiences had led to. I later found that very student utilizing the software to create an original part for a robotics competition. I was amazed at the level of complexity of his design. To say the least, it's extremely impressive for someone his age. These experiences have made me start to realize maybe these skills and talents that we deem so complicated and abstract only seem so because of how rarely and if ever they're even taught. Students including him are now members of EI Squared Junior, the middle school counterpart to our upper school honor society. They have the same tasks and challenges, but they have more time to complete them. So all of these experiences kind of made me start to think, are coding and robotics really that different from reading and writing? In the same way, isn't it the earlier that you learn these skills and the more that you practice them, the more proficient in them you get? There's no reason why lower school or taught these concepts shouldn't be able to utilize this advanced software by the time they get to high school. Now, how do they do this? Well, students are interacting with technology and AI at such an early age. The taller robot you see here is called Moxie. It's an AI-powered robot, and students as early as two years old can talk to it, have conversations, and because it can recognize facial features, it seems pretty realistic. I find it a little creepy, I'm not gonna lie, but it's a really cool tool for lower school students to just start getting involved. And now the other robots you see here that are smaller, we typically use them with lower and middle school students because coding can be very abstract. It's just numbers and letters on a screen that do something. And it's very difficult for a lower and middle school mind to understand that. So what's amazing about Dash is you can program it using an app to make it walk, talk, dance, sing, and do whatever you want. So one thing I feel I must address is when I say that a lower schooler is coding, by no means do I mean that they're coding in Java or C++. They're either directional coding or block coding. The simpler of the two is directional coding and is used with people starting as early as two. It's simply just a little robot with four buttons on it, forwards, backwards, left, and right. And the order you push them in is the order that the robot will execute those commands. It's pretty simple. The other one, block coding, is quite literally blocks of code, as you can see here. You still get the same concepts like if statements, for loops, and variables, but there's no need to memorize syntax which is the vocabulary, the punctuation, and the order that programming languages are written in. And I will admit, the syntax is scary to look at. If you've ever seen one of those movies where someone's hacking, it's a lot of letters and numbers. The question you may be asking yourselves right now is, so what? If only a small percentage of students ever actually go in to computer science or engineering, is it really important for everyone else to learn? Well, great question, but the simple answer is yes it still matters. What you gain from learning these skills, especially at such a young age, is what we like to call computational thinking skills. Now, computational thinking was a term first coined by Jeanette Wing, a researcher at Columbia University, and it refers to our mind's ability to detect algorithms and patterns and build them on our own. So it's applied in many fields like linguistics and economics, but really any field is applicable. So long story short, yes, it still matters. One thing, I feel that I must address when I talk about this is that our school is fully funded to support this development track, and that's very fortunate for us. Unfortunately, that's not the commonality. Good for us, there are extremely low cost or cost-free ways to support this. The program that I've been referring to all night that these students are making their questionable avatars in is Tinkercad. Tinkercad is a completely free website. Anyone can make an account and start designing right now. It's completely free to use, and it's a resource that I suggest everyone kind of start using. It's a great intro to 3D design. The second is Scratch. Now, most people here have either heard of Scratch or used Scratch, one of the combination. It's very popular, and it's used to code. You can code websites, you can code 
apps, you can either use it to code the Dash robots on the picture I showed you before. So how do we prepare students for the future? Let's circle back to the question I asked in the beginning. How do we prepare our future citizens, legislators, and leaders for a world full of AI and technology? Well, by now I hope you've reached the same conclusion that I have, that we implement this into the curriculum starting as early as three years old when reading and writing are being taught. Thinking back to my three-year-old self playing with Legos, I could only imagine being so ecstatic walking into a makerspace and seeing the toys and games there for me to play with. Maybe my rather sizable block of Legos could have been a little less useless. The question we shouldn't be asking ourselves anymore isn't, why would I ever implement this into a curriculum? It should be, why not? Thank you.